Did you see? Well, all right. Look, let me let me just start it like this before we get up out of here. Big Sean did the drink champs. I didn't see the full interview because once again, I guess Revolt has it where you kind of gotta watch Drink Champs the Thursday night. And they don't make it available until like Saturday on YouTube. So all I could see was clips. Did you see any of the clips of uh, Big Sean's Drink Champs? I didn't have a chance to, but fill me in. Tell me what you saw. Uh, the, I saw a couple of clips. Uh, one of the clips was basically talking about the fact that Big Sean was made aware about how bad his good music contract was by Rock Nation. Hmm. <laughs> Which is interesting because they did the same thing with Megan. Um, when it comes to um, was well, it fifteen hundred, the label that put you know Megan in position to become a Rock Nation, you know, represented artist. Mm -hmm. <sighs> but Big Sean also said that you know, I guess he kind of well, he said that Rock Nation said that it was the worst contract they'd ever seen, or something like that. Um, I mean, typical agent talk, you know what I'm saying? The thing is, man, it's like we have to kind of look at things in the overall scope. And Big Sean, I'll give him credit. He did say that, you know, he was looking at a lot of the things when it came to good music as an opportunity. So, they, you know, Nori was asking him about, you know, Kanye's comment on the show about, you know, his worst mistake was signing, you know, Big Sean. And he said at first he thought it was funny and then he was kind of hurt because he's the only person that put out five efforts on good music. And he mm. said he did some writing for Kanye that he's never asked for publishing for and stuff like that. But the thing is, man, like, we have to look at things in a sense where Big Sean was getting opportunities to get on big records that other artists coming out the gate just weren't getting. Um, no, so that's what I'm saying. So, and so, so it's like everything has a cost, right? So it's like, right. so what does so, it cost you if you weren't Kanye's artist to get on these songs? Hold on, hold on, Mike. I mean, let's just go ahead and contextualize it for what it is. Mm -hmm. How far were you from getting on if Ye doesn't come and grab Yeah, where that's you, where, where the opportunity like, comes Like what in. I'm saying is, is if Ye doesn't like... I think, what, was Ye in Detroit that day, like when he was on the radio station or something like that? Is that how it went or he heard him on the radio somehow? I believe right. that's how the story goes, correct? Right, that's how the story so, goes. So, but, but what I'm trying to say is, is like, let's say Ye's not there that day. Where is Big Sean at as an independent artist in that moment that he's going to come out within a year or two of that moment, maybe passing by and get the same type of treatment? The same type of notoriety. I mean, the we just got finished talking about Ice Cube and his uh, ability to know his worth and bet on mm -hmm. himself. And he had a tremendous amount of leverage coming off of NWA. And he made those decisions based on the leverage that he had and, you know, believing in his abilities. Yeah. I think that a lot of times when you launch artists, and we saw it with, like, the locks and things like that, when you... When you when you jump on like something that's moving, like Bad Boy Records, what kind of contract do you expect at this point? You know what I'm saying? Like, because all contracts are not created equal, right? Mike, all of, like so, <clears throat> and so with, with management saying it's the worst contract they ever seen, it's like, well, okay, well, you kind of got to put that in context based on what artist and what that artist has done. And what that artist was able to negotiate at that time. Like the amenities. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So let's say that you work a corporate job in a heavy traffic area. Let's say you work in D.C. And you work in L.A. or you work in Atlanta. And you get a job offer. And one job offer is $10,000 more than the other one. But they don't have any parking situated. So every day that you pull up to work you're going to have to pay for parking. But the right. other job that's paying you $10,000 less has a parking deck, and they're taking care of your parking for the rest of, for, for, for the, rest of the year because you're one of their employees. Right. Those are separate jobs. The amenities that come with them are different. The money's over here. The amenities over here, you have to weigh it what it's worth. Parking in Atlanta can be anywhere from $10 to $30 a day, depending on the day. You weigh that out over the course of the month, over the course of the year, 
give me the amenities. And that's not and even counting gas. distance, right? If we're talking cash, about gas, right? We're talking about the gas, and Mike, and here's the thing, that cash, or that cash getting taxed, give me mm. the amenities. <laughs> so no. he took the amenities. I and think, Mike, and I think for Big well, Sean's career. Mike, Mike, and it served him well because he's been a star from almost the moment that he stepped exactly. on the scene. And you know why he's been a star? Because he was able to get on some very important records with some very important people very early. Beyond, yes. yes. Yeah. And, and those are opportunities that a lot of, and we see it all the time, a lot of real bubbling artists who have a lot of talent don't get those opportunities to get on click, to get on, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're yeah. on a record with Jay-Z and Kanye West. And again, I'm not trying to sit here and act like that's your payment or whatever. <laughs> but if we do look at these things in context, the biggest part of launching a new act is making the public familiar with them. If I can get you on a song with two of the biggest stars in the world, that that's going to really help that part of the mission. Mike, in the history of rap. <laughs> and not just those guys like Mike. I mean, he that's what I mean. He got full access to a lot of guys. Mike, his second, he got Drake. He got tracks with Drake. He got tracks with Jay. He got tracks with Yeah. He got tracks with Pusha. He mm -hmm. got tracks with Future. Yeah. Like, that's what I'm saying. He was set up for success. He chose the amenities and it served him well. So when they're saying the contract is shitty, it's like, well, yeah, the contract was probably shitty. Them amenities was A list amenities. Well, let's look okay. at it like this. Let's look at it in basketball terms, right? And we can look at it in two different ways. If you end up on a championship squad and you were a second round pick or something like that, you're not breaking the bank until. You prove that okay, you guys need me, right? You know, so, like like let's look at Draymond Green or somebody like Mike, that. You took the words right out of my mouth. I was thinking about Draymond. I mean, it is yeah. what it is. Like you think Draymond's gonna come out the gate when he's he's coming off the bench? He was able to step in for David Lee. You know, what I'm saying from an injury, and he's getting whatever he was getting, probably somewhat of a minimum in the NBA. Set. He's not gonna go to the 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 GM and owner like I need more money. No, he's gonna wait until it's renegotiation time and like look, this is the work I've done. Boom, boom, boom. This is what it is. Could Draymond Green go out there and say his first contract was a shitty contract? No, it was what it was at the time. Right, and also too, Mike. This is what I mean too. You got to seize the moment that you have opportunities. The the biggest thing that happened to Draymond's career that people forget is that the coaches changed. Mm -hmm. Steve Kerr came in and asked Andre Iguodala to sit on the bench because he saw something in Draymond in the way that he wanted to run his offense that he thought it might be a better fit for Draymond to start. And for Andre Iguodala, who had already been like a two- or three-time All-Star at the time, asked him to come off the bench in favor of this young guy who was only in his second year. And yeah. so he also seized the moment and the opportunity and ran with it too, much like Sean did. Yeah. Uh, DeCarlo says, nobody in Detroit knew who Sean was before, yay? All we know here is uh, the Icewear Vizos and T Grizzlies of the world. He would have remained undiscovered, in my opinion. He said, Mike, Big Sean, so, he said, uh, oh, he said something else, too. He said, Big Sean had an opportunity that was unheard of for a new artist. Mike, so can I speak to a couple things? He also I said, oh, one more good thing he said. Big Sean's kind of like Kyrie. He played with the best, but at the end of the day, he's just not that. What? No, he's not that. I'm going to say something. I'm not saying this because I'm a Duke fan. I'm saying this because I've been following Kyrie since he was in high school, since I, since I was a Duke fan. Oh, no, 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 no. Kyrie was Hall of Fame caliber talent as a high school. And it always has been. So the comparison is not the same. We're talking about the guy with the six But I think this is the mentality we're talking about playing with LeBron and expecting 50, 40, 90, Like he had a 50, 40, 90 season last year. There, there aren't 10 guys in NBA history that have done that. No, he it's was real. Next and and I, think, it. I think Kyrie's very talented. But yeah, I feel where both of y'all are coming from. But go ahead. No, what were you going to say? But, here, but here's what I will say to him that I agree with Mike because I know a lot of people from the D. Nobody really associates with him like – from the D, like on a hip hop rap scene level, like he's yep. not their guy per se. So he's speaking to something when he's saying that. And also to the opportunity, Mike, I know a little bit about the Detroit rap scene, not a lot, but from what I know of the scene, I don't know anybody in the history of that rap scene that got that opportunity. So he's right about that. It's real. And, you know, and at the end of the day, opportunity costs. Just like, you know, let's just keep it real. If I had a song and let's say the biggest, Radio DJ in Atlanta, let's just say that radio is still king. And that's how people 
hear their music. If yeah. I go to him and I know what his spin could do for my record, that shit's going to cost me one way or another. One way or another. Either right? out the pocket or when shit goes down and I get a I get the um you know the contract or get discovered, he's getting something and he should. Yeah, I mean, Mike, you got to play the game when you want to choose to get in the game. And so, you know. But see, but again, I, I, I don't I like. Feel, but but see, I feel it, him on being hurt because, you know, because what that probably took him back to is he's probably thinking back to that moment when Kanye actually signed him and probably how happy and how relieved and how joyous and what that moment was. And so to hear somebody that offered you that opportunity say that about you years later, yeah, that has to hurt the sting. Too. Well, the reason why he said it, obviously, was because he saw, you know, the, well, Kanye West felt like the Democratic Party was using John Stevens, a.k.a. John Legend and um, Big Sean to work against him and his uh, campaign run. Now, I think what Big Sean oh, said in the, in the clip that I saw, what Big Sean said was he was the first person to tweet Kanye for president. OK, he, he you did, can tweet was. Kanye for president. But when it actually became something real, what were you doing? I didn't like that part of it. Maybe it's more to the interview because again, these are clips. What's, what's what's that shit that Ross said on Big Time? I watch your actions, not the shit that you post. Yeah, yeah. Like you, how how corny would that be? I tweet Coop for president, and then you actually on the ballot, and I'm like, uh, no, we're not doing that anymore. Like, really? Find another co-host, Mike. <laughs> like what? <laughs> That I didn't understand that, but again, I'm gonna look at the whole interview when it comes out. Maybe he has something to refute that, but yeah, he was him saying that he was the first to tweet Kanye for president. I don't think that has a lot of legs when it was clear that you were out there. Oh, and he also said, Yeah, I wasn't, I'm not political or something. He was saying, But you were out here telling people to vote, you were at these Democrat rallies, you were. Mike, that answer that he gave was very political. I was the first one to tweet Kanye for president. You sound like you're on the soapbox right now. I ain't even seen the interview. That's, uh, yeah. I mean, again, I think that when it comes to, and we said this in that show where after we were covering the, uh, the first Drink Samps interview, a uh, part one that Kanye did, I think anything that Kanye has to say about John Legend, Big Sean, or even common to a certain degree. He has the right to feel however way he wants to feel about it. I mean, it's freedom of speech at the end of the day anyway, Mike. But also, too, yeah, like on a personal level, yeah, probably got a right to say something. Because let's say that wasn't their agenda. They're intelligent enough to know how it looked. I mean, just say that. that say you don't rock with him. Just say you don't rock with him. Be a man about it. <laughs> what the jury about it. No, 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 for real. Say it no, with your chest. No, no, for real. Like, just say it with your chest. I mean, again, like, they, again, they're talking around it like politicians, like you said. And it's one of those things where, well, just tell us why you were in full support of another campaign and not his. Yeah, I mean, can like, you at least like, articulate that? And I think that my biggest problem, what? my biggest problem with a lot of these entertainers, and we were just talking about it with the Ice Cube thing, my biggest problem with these entertainers that go out there and tell you to vote a certain way, that's fine. But when people aren't happy with the people that you told them to go support, you're <laughs> silent. At least speak about displeasures in that regard as well. Or at least be, be a leader enough, since you want to galvanize people to go support somebody, be a leader enough to listen to people in their gripes and express that too. So Mike, there's, there, there's a psychological connotation to this of us as um, blacks and our affluent blacks in the entertainment and sports sphere that have money that speaks for them and allows them in these rooms, we have a bad problem psychologically with just wanting to put the next white authority figure in place instead of looking at our own. And that's the biggest misstep of it. There's something psychologically broken about the approach to how they did it. It's like, no, it's like you're supposed to empower him. You're a black man of affluence with money. This is a black man of affluence and money that's actually responsible for your affluence and money to a degree. Yeah. Psychological 
on that level because we have a tendency to just go support the next white man or woman in these days and times that we're living in instead of really taking a hard, honest look at our own. And it's like, and it's, and you know what, and this is what I mean about be a man about it. It's like, well, if you don't trust Ye and you think Ye is crazy, be a man and say it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, point blank period. I mean, but at the end of the day, it's one of those things too. I just don't, it's hard. I, I hate to say it like this, but I kind of just wish that a lot of our entertainers, if they're not going to go all the way, just stay, stay out home. of it, man. Yeah, yeah. just stay yeah. out of it, man. Because if you're not going to go out there and whoever you, who you're going so hard for and at these rallies and stuff, like Common was down in Atlanta at the uh, Joe Biden rally, if you're not going to be a voice of the people on the same level when people have issue with the fact that their student loans aren't being paid, and all that stuff, or student loans aren't getting uh, forgiven, I don't want to hear you say anything then. If you're not going to, you know, do the whole thing, just chill, man. I, I done got to the point where I've respected athletes and entertainers now who just say, you know what, I'm going to stay out of it. Right. Because no, if I you ain't going to go all the way... Well, Mike, so many people are stepping into the fear that are misinformed, unprepared, being puppets themselves... And you know what, Mike? It's just like you said. My favorite song on Trap or Die 2, Mike, go hard or go home. Yeah. Go hard or go home, Mike. Yeah. yeah. I don't want, like I home. said, man, I don't want to, and we're even seeing it in Atlanta, you know, and I respect everybody who's out here doing their thing in the city. You remember when Keisha uh, Lance Bottoms first got elected? Everybody was, you know, yada, yada, it's party, mm -hmm. this and that. But when it came to the point where she was under fire, we hear nothing. Now we done moved on to a whole new mayor. Oh, my mayor's name is Dre. And I don't know much about him. You know, I haven't done as much research as I need to on him. But again, let's not sit here and act like none of this other stuff happened. You know what I mean? Like, we have to... The whole process doesn't work if people aren't being held accountable in the moment. Like, they expect us to just change clothes with it. Like, okay... New person, right. that didn't happen. New person, no, that Mike, didn't happen. Mike, Mike, you're right. We, we like the party. I actually managed the event for Kasim Reed's inauguration party. Mm -hmm. Everybody was there, Mike. I ran into Shirley Franklin at a bar the day after she got elected. No, Mike, we like the party. We support them real, real big when they get on, and then they come under fire, and then we leave. The we Carlos like the says, I personally don't think our entertainers, uh, our entertainment giants should be our leaders in politics ever. Uh, we need more MLKs and... You know, Mark and uh, Malcolm X's. Yeah, I mean, I think that at the end of the day, I mean, that's right. But we have to also understand that our entertainers have a large amount of inf influence. And the fact that they are tools to a certain degree for many political pundits to endorse them, that just lets you know how much this works. I just think it's unfortunate that you know, the Cardi B's of the world or whoever, they'll, they're going to have to sit with this. So if they tell somebody, you go vote for this person, and then that person goes in there and stinks up the joint, I'm not listening to her anymore on anything. Yeah. And it's like, you get left with the bag, or our entertainers get left with the bag, but it's like, yeah, at this point, man, you kind of just got to stay out of it. We seen Puffy during this election cycle just go all over the place. You remember that? <laughs> he was all over the place. He was like, we'll start our own party. Uh, I ain't voting for this person. The vote's for sale. You got to vote for Joe Biden. And I was like, what's going on, man? <laughs> all of this, Mike, all of this, is why I'm now independent. I don't even <laughs> like the consciousness of even belonging. I think any any responsible entertainer, oh, I mean, all jokes aside, you know, white, black, whatever, any responsible entertainer should tell people, just like they tell them about this other thing that's going on, do your own research and make your own decision. That's it. Yeah, I did because my independent if you're not research. Here, Mike, Mike, I did some independent research, found out I needed to go independent. Yeah, that's what yeah. I <laughs> That's all that's what they need to say because at the end of the day, if you're not gonna sit here and ride with this thing all the way through, because where are the people that was telling you to vote, you know, Biden and Harris now when people aren't pleased with certain things? They in the win. But what they're gonna do in the next four years, they're gonna pop back up, tell you to vote for somebody else. Just stay out of it, man. And let people make their own decisions. But I think that's what Big Sean just got caught up in. 
He doesn't want to admit it. But somebody told him to do that. He didn't nobody go out there on his admit, own and do that. Nobody wants to admit it, Mike. Yeah. Nobody. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 you know, the thing is, crazy old Kanye is calling people out and everybody want to just... People, pe okay, so so I don't think people... Sometimes people really don't understand how money and power truly does, like, corrupt the soul. I saw a post about a woman saying, like, don't think that a millionaire man won't sit up here and do certain things when you got dudes out here that's making $50,000 a year. And you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so what you have to understand is, is that a lot of these guys don't realize they're puppets and pawns till they've been played. Till it's too and late. You're right. No, you're right. I think they come in there with good intentions and then yeah. you get in too deep. DeCarlo says Michael Jordan had the right idea. Yes, he did. And, you know, a lot of people criticize Michael Jordan for what he did. But at the end of the day, let's keep it real. If he didn't go out there and do as big as Michael Jordan's voice was at that time, um, if he didn't go out there and do his own independent research, or even if he did, he goes out there telling people to vote for a certain politician in a certain state, and then he goes back to his job playing basketball. What if this guy starts stealing money? You can't, you know, I don't work with you every day. I don't know what you're doing to that degree. You know what I'm saying? Like, so now my name is enwoven in this individual. Just stay out of it. I mean, Mike, Michael Jordan's biggest uh, misstep was actually when he said, what did he say? Republicans wear sneakers too? I mean, Mike, that's not a totally unintelligible sentiment for the time of where he was at in his career for him to say that. I don't see anything wrong with that. I don't necessarily see anything wrong with it. I never necessarily did. Because, Mike, you want to know what? He's saying something when he's saying that. He's saying, you asking me to get involved in something when really I'm out here playing basketball and selling sneakers. He was telling you in a very slight of hand kind of way, kind of not informed on that. Yeah. Informed on and that's fine. He's doing his job. I'm kind of informed on selling these sneakers. I think those guys buy sneakers, too. I think I'm going to go back to playing basketball and selling these sneakers. Exactly. I mean, because at the end of the day, he plays for the city of Chicago, right? They got they got fans of all types of, um, you know, political backgrounds. I'm not going to sit here and isolate myself. And, that's, background. Come on, and cultural back backgrounds, Mike. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because yeah. at the end of the day, man, like I said, he, I think he, uh, his mother was supporting the candidate who would have been, I think, what, the first black governor of uh, North Carolina? Um, oh, yeah. yeah, his mother was. Uh, Good luck with that, Mike. I'm from North Carolina. Right, Good right. luck with that. So his mother was endorsing the candidate and he gave money, whatever, you know, do whatever you want, yada, yada. That I mean, that's at that point, can you fault him for that? <laughs> if he didn't want to get involved and like you said where his focus was was playing sports and perfecting his craft I don't want to sit here and add a whole political you know possible whatever of a whole nother state that I don't even live in to my that's what I'm saying. And, and, and like why, why should support. he even take on that burden that's the thing that's the okay, thing I so want to say so, so let's unpack that right quick there seems to be like this some sort of unwritten code that says that if you have power and money in the black community, you're supposed to thrust yourself into the political sphere. Mm -hmm. And Mike, I'm going to tell you <clears throat> one of the things that touched me most. Mike, do you remember that video from a few years ago where Michael Jordan was out in L.A. and these two dudes were about to, I guess they were about to squab and Mike was just like, no, nah, don't do that. And they stopped because it's Michael Jordan. <laughs> like Mike. We need more of that more than we need people going up to the White House and Capitol Hill if you really want to get down to it and know the truth. You I mean, know what I mean? We need, day, more people, I, we need more people that, that like take their power and influence and actually yield it and wield it to touch people in the community because of who they are. Then do stop because it's like Mike told us to stop. Like right. they felt bad about cranking up in front of Mike because Mike like, what y'all doing in front of me? Right. And they, you know, and it resonated with them to the point, simmer down. You know, that, I think you said something too. That's where that's making a difference. It's like there's such a responsibility on you know black entertainers or you know people who are public figures in the black. But community. you can step it's out a, every a, day and make that impact without getting on the fucking TV screen. <laughs> but it gets to a point too. You have to understand when you're being used. I think Michael Jordan at an early age, same as Ice Cube, they realize when they're being used. And when that becomes a thing, they stop. You're not going to sit here and use Michael Jordan. 
Jordan brand. No. <laughs> You know, at the end of the day, the partnership with Nike was the most that he was going to get used for. And when you look at that at the end of the day, he really didn't. But it was just inevitable. They kind of made each other. He knew yeah. that I need to focus on my game. They're a sneaker company, so they could focus on that. That's a partnership right there. And yeah. he was like, look, I'm not going to sell any shoes if my game is trash. So I can't sit here and build a sneaker company myself and build a basketball career they're building the sneakers. I'm building the career, and then Jordan Brand ended up being separate once he retired. But I'm not mistaken. Didn't the Jordans come out like the first Jordans came out when '86, right? Was it '86? I felt like it was '84. Was it '84? Was really? '85? So it was early. It was early. Yeah, it. But Mike, I remember like them first couple of shoes, like they did well. But Mike, then he averaged 37 points a game. Mm -hmm. And then those shoes never stop selling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and that's when it's a partnership. If look, if you make shoes, and I get on the court and sell those shoes that you're making, right. that's a partnership. And I I'm mean, able like, to focus. I mean, you're able to focus on making the shoes. I'm able to focus on averaging thirty-seven a game. We went. I mean, I mean, Mike. People forget that season. He had had a stretch where he had like had 40 points for like 13 or 14 straight games. Like he was doing ungodly stuff in those shoes. Like he was doing stuff that season. People had never seen before and it submitted it. The next the year, whole gotta be the shoes Mike, campaign. Mike, the next year, Mike, the next year it's gotta be the shoes. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, man. We, we're going to get out of here in a second, but I, I saw, um, I saw a clip on one of those Jordan pages where they were showing his brother. Uh, what's his name? Larry. Who's was like, he's like five, eight, which is so wild. But he had a 44-inch vertical. Mike. And, 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 and his family over six feet, I believe, before he had his kids. Everybody yeah. the highest, the tallest dude in his family was like our height. Yeah. And so so Larry had like a 44-inch vertical. Somebody was like, they lied to us the whole time. It's not the shoes, it's the jeans. Yeah. You 6'6 six, six with a 48-inch vertical, Michael Jordan? Say goodnight. Listen, man, I... I Call the curtains for everybody. Yeah, and you're skilled, and you're fundamentally sound, and no, you got Mike. a motor, and you're running no, what? Mike. They said he was running a 4-3 in North Carolina. No, the Mike, fuck? that's what I'm talking about, Mike. It's not just that he had all the gifts, Mike. It said he wanted it more than anybody else, too. That's crazy. It is crazy. <laughs> and he was trying to, uh, he said, you know, he worked on his jumping and all. I don't know, man. He had natural abilities. Like, this is... Um, no, Mike, Mike, there was a season... Where like he literally went back and you could tell he spent all off season working on his jumper and he could shoot. Oh yeah. It was like he came back one off season. It's like, okay, he can shoot now. Oh damn, we in trouble. We in trouble, trouble. <laughs> yeah. And when he was able to start scoring with his back to the basket, it was over. Mm, yeah. I think it's when he learned how, how to score in crucial moments and not just score all the time, you know? Yeah, yeah. And when was able to utilize the rest of his team too. When he started learning when to score, you couldn't beat him. Because he's like, No, 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 I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna now. And, you know, I don't want to be one of those people that's like, you know, just because I kind of grew up in the Jordan era that nobody could beat Jordan. But I truly believe Jordan in his prime on the court with these guys today, I, he would do the same things, if not more. And I know hey, that there are more athletic players at that position now than it was in the 90s. But just I, I haven't seen that athletic ability in such a skilled player since. You got somebody like a Kobe who's super skilled, but he didn't have the athleticism that Jordan had. LeBron might be the closest, but see, I, but, here, yeah. but see, but here, see, when you're saying saying that, I think you're talking about wingmen because I think the thing that we really missed is Mike. I don't know how you feel. I think Akeem Olajuwon is the best defensive player I ever saw. I would have liked to have seen that finals. I want to see Mike go to the lane against Hakeem in his prime. Hakeem in his prime is the best shot blocker, defensive player I ever seen. And it was much like Mike. He did it as much with his mind as with his athleticism. Hakeem's timing on on uh, drivers of the ball going into the paint and him altering the direction of the shot or putting his hands on the shot outright mm -hmm. in his prime is almost unmatched to me because he wasn't like a super tall guy. No, he wasn't. So Hakeem's so the best this? center I ever that saw. Would have been, how about this? One of those Hakeem teams would have given Mike a seven-game series, in my opinion. That would have been the seven-game series. I think that, um, and I hate that we didn't get a chance to see them in the finals together. I think Utah stopped that, right? Um, yeah. I think Akeem, 
is the best center I ever seen. Like just on a night in, night out basis. I've seen the highlights. Yeah, I've seen the highlights for Kareem, who I think is, you know, top three. Same thing for Wilt. But as far as like somebody that I was able to see live and when it was happening, Hakeem's probably the best that I ever seen. But it's just I don't about, think I don't think him in his position, if Akeem's giving you his best game, if Jordan's giving you his best game on the other end, I, I got to think the Jordan team's going to win. I, I just do. Akeem's the only guy that I thought was good enough on both ends to offset that because that's what I'm saying. No, he could go get you 30, but he could also go control the game defensively. Mike never had to deal with that on both ends in the finals. Do you never. think that, um, that Rodman would have really helped against Akeem? See, okay, so, but, see, that's what I'm saying. Where would Rodman come into the occasion? Because that's what I'm saying. That 94 team, oh, I think they're giving the Bulls a seven-game series. Rodman's okay. not there. You got Horace Grant probably still. Okay. I think if we're talking about the Horace, Horace Grant, Grant and Bill Cartwright um, Bulls, Yeah, Mike, can you say 35 and 15 for a king? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> but if we're talking about the 72 and 10 team, because I think the Sonics beat them in that year. Yeah, I, I'm good were, with I'm good with Rodman guarding Hakeem. Mike, uh, Mike, he undressed David Robinson in his prime, and David Robinson was taller, stronger, and faster. Rodman don't stand a chance. 35-15. <laughs> Rodman's different, man. I mean, Mike, Mike, no, Hakeem's different. No, like, Hakeem's different. different. I think the Hakeem fact that Rodman different. could just focus on defense and Jordan wouldn't have to really even worry about Hakeem. Hakeem's gonna get hit. Mike, if you were to put Dennis Rodman on Akeem Olajuwon in his prime during the NBA Finals, 35 and 15. And I think Dennis Rodman's one of the 10 best defenders of all time, 35 and 15, Mike. I think that he could get in his head. I, I feel like that. Mike, Rodman... there were guys big. Mike, Mike, Shaq, Patrick Ewan, and David Robinson didn't want that smoke. What makes you think Rodman want that smoke? They couldn't fuck with him. I'm with uh, Madman. I think Mike, that I think Mike, he was doing 28, 12, 14 on those guys. You put Dennis Rodman on him 35 and 15 every, every game. Well, every who, game. who's guarding Jordan on Houston? Drexel? It, which, uh, Vernon Maxwell. Vernon Maxwell, if we're talking the original team, probably. Are you talking about the original team, man? He ain't, no, Master. Listen. Vernon Maxwell's a pretty solid defender. I mean, Mike gonna go get 40. Mike, we already know that. King getting 35. Mike getting 40. How's this defensive matchup gonna go? I, listen, I agree and with also, you. I wish we could have seen this matchup when the Bulls played the Suns because I'm that's the year that else. Jordan averaged 43 in the finals. Against Phoenix, 41. Yeah, 41, almost 42 points, I believe. Yeah. But, but here's what I'm saying to that too, Mike, is, is that, no, like, Akeem, Mike, like, that's different because here's what I'm saying. Akeem, unlike the other post guys from that era, you could give Akeem the ball in the clutch because he was an 80 to 85% free throw shooter, too. So nothing was about to change about the game. No, I agree with that. Right. That's what Akeem made him will get that ball with a minute left, too. So it's still a problem. It's not like it was with Shaq or Ewan, where it's like, oh, we want to give him the ball, but we'd rather have somebody else shoot it because we don't want them going to the free throw line. David Robinson was like a 73% free throw shooter. Mike, Akeem, 80, 82, 84, yeah. 85%. That's different when the game is on the line and shit is close. And your best player can hit free throws and happens to be a center who can play defense as well. Yeah, it was really entertaining to watch uh, Shaq and Akeem in that finals. But, you know, I, I really hated that Orlando got swept because, you know, at that time I was like in the seventh grade, man. Like, oh Orlando God. was cool. Like, you had Penny Hardaway. Like, that finals was the best thing that ever happened to Shaq's career because you know what he came back with next year? Footwork and fundamentals because he got undressed. You know, Shaq got his, but it wasn't enough. He got his, but it didn't look yeah, like it, he it got didn't his look like he was it. getting undressed. Yeah. Right. All right, man, let's get up out of here, man. I got some things to do for the event that we're, you know, doing on Sunday. If anybody's in the Atlanta area, definitely come out. We're going to be at E-Complex. We're going to be reporting live, too. Uh, Nick the Quick's going to be on the ones and twos. We're going to have some hip-hop trivia going. You know, we're going to be, um, you know, collecting canned goods and blankets for the homeless. It's going to be cool. Yeah. The kickbacks to get it. back. Bring your donatable items, please. Yes, sir. All right, man, well... Good talk about everything, man. And this Dr. Dre music, again, I don't think Kendrick's dropping, but you do. Yeah. <laughs>